21 combinations. So again, this is a class where we're merging the two together, so we should be simultaneously scheduled for both of those. As far as we know, we've got everybody registered. There should be 257 in the class. So we should have a few more seats here. Some of them may already be in line for football seats. So, uh, Full-time fans and part-time students. Um, reminder of where we were last week, those maybe didn't come to the welcome session. Uh, by now, you should have signed up on Bridge. You should be getting your resumes in the format and getting those uploaded. Again, remember, we're going to be applying for jobs. There'll be one resume through the website of the corporation. You must upload it through Bridge. Otherwise, you won't get on the interview schedule. If you haven't been on Bridge, you're already a week behind. You've got to get on Bridge because that is going to be the system that everything will be communicated with. Their info session is going very heavily back to back to back. I was through three minutes yesterday alone. And so the companies are coming very early and they want to grab the best brightest as quick as they can, and they're seeing that coming, we're seeing that companies are coming earlier every year, so it starts awfully fast. And so get your resume, get that ready to go, you should also get your skill summary, elevator pitch, a number of other things ready to go, and we'll talk about in the next few classes. Other things, announcements, you should have also been working on your 321 assignment. You have now until December, I'm sorry, until September, not December, September 25th to have selected your mentor. That's from the database for that. If you have questions, then you need to get in touch with career counselors or someone in the career center to learn about getting that selected. You need your mentors picked fairly soon. They've been scrubbing the database, getting that cleaned up over the summer. If there's always some turnover, and if you pick a mentor, they may have changed and gone on to another job. So they do everything they can to keep that updated. If you need to be getting your mentor picked, and it's a two-way connection. You've got to reach out to them if they need to reply to you. I know when I was a mentor for about 10 years, People would email me, but it would take me a couple days to get back but I've been in Asia or somewhere there. So don't get too slow on that because this is people's time is valuable and you want to make sure you get on their calendars as well. So those are the assignments you should have already been either completed with your resume and or in process and selecting your mentor. Today we're going to be talking about building your personal brand through your resume. And so that will be our topic for the class today. We have a guest we have talked to quite a few things to help us on that. We're going to start with an opening prayer. We ask Spencer Richards from Alpine News Boston, major in entrepreneurship, to give our opening prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are very grateful for this opportunity which we have to be on this great campus and for uh, the, the many great teachers and for the, the programs that are here for us. So grateful for the day that we have to be together here to look more into our careers and be able to explore more uh, fields. And Father, we ask that that will help us to open our minds and that we may be able to be guided in the ways that we need. Father, we love thee and we say these things in the name of life, Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Spencer. Appreciate you doing that for us. Are there any general questions on procedure the class layout? The Red Learning Suite is pretty accurate out there. Something that's a burning question, we want to make sure we cover it here. Anything in particular has come to mind? Will this class only be in this room? Because there's several different room numbers. There's several different room numbers. We will meet as a group. We're, we're in the supply chain business school. We're going to do economies of scale for things that are going to apply across all areas regardless of discipline. And then we'll start splitting off into by discipline. And so, for example, there'll be four different breakouts, and we'll start using those a little bit later. You go out and look on Learning Suite when I say you start meeting. One on one with your career advisor, that's when we'll start using those rooms. For example, I do undergrad supply chain and general business. We will be meeting every week in one of those rooms. And we'll be covering the same assignments that others are doing one on one. And then there'll be some additional things we'll cover in supply chain and general business. So, good question from that side. We will continue being at 151 for the next, um, probably for the next uh, six, up through session seven. So that's after up to October 6th, up through and including October 16th after that, you start splitting off into individual tracks and specializing the information you receive. Other questions, general ones? Okay. Today we're going to hear from Bill Brady, one of our colleagues in the Career Center, and one we've all grown to respect a great deal because of his expertise. He's uh, got a strong background in the career services area, He's worked at BYU since 1994 uh, with both graduate and undergraduate business career services and assisting students in their career search process. He's been twice on, served on the board of directors for the MBA Career Services Council and president of that council from 2003 to 4. He's also a member of two recruitment issues task forces for the National Association of Colleges and, and Employers, which is called NACE. As 
strong background in the business world. He spent 23 years in the private sector, everything from a labor economist to vice president of human resources and chief legal officer of a very major corporation. Worked for the Fremont Group, it's a $10 billion investment management private equity group. Worked for Park City Solutions, a systems consulting organization. Price Waterhouse Management Consulting Services, which later became PwC, uh, particularly in, uh, in the San Francisco office providing campus recruiting and office operations. He also worked for the Beckel Group of companies in multiple HR and supply chain positions, including his executive in their HR areas. Been an active member of Society for Human Resource Management, or those of you know HR is SHRM for short, and been in the San Francisco area HR Planning Council. Broad range of background in human resources. I think a better qualified person to talk to us about resumes, Bill. Thanks very much. What we're going to talk about today is basically building a world-class resume. Just want to lower those lights; so it's not quite as washed out. Um, resumes are all about you, and generally, what I find is that no one is really hired from a resume. But what the resume does is it gives you an interview, and so what resumes do is they're an advertisement to get you an interview. Because inevitably, it's the interview that qualifies you and that makes them understand that you're a fit for their organization. So one of the things that I'm always concerned with and that I always talk about in building your resume is I want you to make it very effective. Now I'm gonna just take a moment and show you an effective ad. That's a Bugatti Vitas. I think I said that. That's French. What's, what's the French pronunciation? The test means speed. Uh, and you can see 1,200 horsepower, 260 plus miles per hour for that model. Uh, Bugatti is very focused in the way they advertise. A uh, couple of reasons. Number one, an oil change on this. Oh, it is fast. I forgot that. 0 to 218 seconds. It is an accelerating beast. But it is not cheap. An oil change is 25,000 miles or $25,000 and you're required to change oil every 3,000 miles. Um, likewise, tires are custom built by Michelin for the VTS and they are $20,000 each. And they must be changed every 3,000 miles. Likewise, every three tire changes, you have to replace the wheels. And the wheels are $65,000 for a set. 
So it's not a cheap car. That's the base price. Now, if you want to customize it, it goes up. So, uh, and they've, they've actually built one that was about $30 million. Uh, it was gold plated. Um, the reason I show you this and the reason we talk about it is really they target, they look, they want you, or they want to appeal <coughs> to a group of people who have a lot of spare change. Likewise, what I want you to do when you write your resume is to target your resume. I want you to make a sale to an organization that wants to hire you. And I want that organization to pay you a lot. And so to get there, to get that job that is the, uh, the you know, that bullseye job, there's a few things that you've got to be aware of and that need to be, go into the bullseye or the target of your resume. Number one, I want you to show me the skills that you're developing. I'm assuming that you're in school, and the reason you're in school is because you're developing a set of skills that you can bring to an organization. Likewise, you've got some skills. You didn't get here without having some skills, and so we want to know what those current skills are. And then, to narrow down to that bullseye, what I want you to do is to show me of these two outer rings, what you have that matches my job. And that's what we're going to talk about a lot today, is just targeting your resume. Um, let me start with just a few things that a resume is not. Number one, it is not your autobiography. It isn't your life story. I don't want to read your whole life story. I may later, as I want to promote you, but initially that's not what I'm about. It isn't a list of everything that you've ever done. <coughs> However, I want you to put together a list of everything you're, you've ever done, and we'll talk about it, that in a minute. But a resume excludes irrelevancy. So you want to be only the things that are important to me, the reader. And by the way, a resume is not designed to be read. Resumes are scanned, and they're scanned very quickly. And that requires that you build your resume so that the scanning catches and presents your information very quickly. <coughs> it is not a place to make mistakes. I'm sorry, but as college students, sometimes you get in a hurry. And it's not that we don't know that you have a lot of things besides homework and social life and a lot of other things to, to do. And so sometimes you put off writing your resume until the last minute. And that last minuteness often makes mistakes occur. And as a recruiter, if I saw a mistake in a, a resume, that probably was the end of my going or with that person. Because if they didn't have enough uh, wisdom to send me a perfect picture of themselves, they weren't wise enough to work for my company. So uh, it used to be interesting that my, my recruiters from Intel would say, if you're not smart enough to use spell check, you're not smart enough to work for Intel. So what is a resume? Number one, it's proof that you can do the job. Now I'm going to show you how your resume is also a way to get an interview question answered. There, it, in my mind, there are only three questions that you ever have to answer when you go to an interview. And the first question that you have to answer is, can you do the job? So if you have presented in your resume proof that you can do this job, or reasons for you to believe that, then we get to the interview and it's a, an easy presentation. So proof that you can do the job. Number two, I want to know that you're going to love working at the job that I have. Now that doesn't mean you have to have you know, love and flowers and kumbaya all the time, but the idea is that I want proof that you're not going to hate this job when you come into it. And by the way, that's question number two. Number one, can you do this job? Number two, will you love this job? So if you can show me those things and demonstrate that in your resume, I'm going to suddenly start saying, this is going to be a fun interview. All right, what else is it? It's a place where you show me the skills value proposition that you present. Now, most of, the, of you who are in marketing or who are involved in, in anything that deals with valuation, what is it that you're always looking for? We want value. We want a, I want to buy a product that is a value. 
And what I need you to, to, to help me do is to see your value proposition to my organization. So we want some of that into the resume that will help you. It is a basic chronology. Um, and especially for students and, and students coming in to me, interview with me and from colleges, I wanted to see a little bit of the history. There are two types of resumes and, and then a hybrid of those. One is called a, a, a chronological resume and the other is a, a functional resume. And functional resumes are usually used by people who have lots of experience and who can summarize functions like leadership, decision making, uh, uh, financial uh, uh, acumen, those kinds of things. So, but for you, you can do a chronological resume uh, and we suggest that. Finally, it's a demonstration of your fit with the employer's culture and the employer's team. We have, in the accounting program, four major employers, and they basically do the same things. The difference is what their teams are composed of, and a little bit difference in their culture relative to the work process. And so we always recommend to students that you look at the culture. And by the way, that's the last question of the three questions, and that's, can we tolerate you in our company? So can you do the work? Can you do the job? Can, will you love the job? And can we tolerate you in this job? So that's proof that you will probably be a good candidate. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is that your resume is also an incredible tool for shaping what the interview will be like. Because they see the, they see the resume and they say, hey, we like this person. Let's bring this person in for an interview. And what I want you to do is to use that resume as a cheat sheet. Only place that I'll authorize a cheat sheet at BYU. But, but use it to plant questions you would like them to ask. So it's an important way to build that interview because if you built it, you know the answers. And you just invite them to say, how did you do this? Oh, let me tell you. So there we go. The secret in most interviewing today and in most resumes today are skills. We want to know your skills. And we're going to talk a little bit in more depth about that. but. But remember that skills are what I'm looking for. Um, quick quote, and, and I'll show you why we're quoting this, but resumes are first dates in the employment process. This is a fun book called Amazing Resumes. And I think college students can relate to this because many of you are either dating or have been dating or will be dating and understand that. So we put together an analogy. And that was that if the resume is the first date, then maybe an interview is the second date. So the resume looked good, first date was good, ah, okay, let's do this again. And uh, so the interview becomes the second date. In the analogy, the next thing that happens is you get invited to an office visit. And on the dating analogy, we'll call that the DTR. This is when we're gonna be serious, we're gonna really, this, do you think this should go further? And uh, so we'll use the DTR. The third, fourth area is you're going to get an offer. And the offer, when it comes, is, in the dating analogy, a proposal. And consider those offers as seriously. And you can, you can refuse an offer. You can refuse a proposal. You can uh, you do all of those things. The next step, of course, is if you accept the offer, that's like an engagement. And we have a serious concern, and it's a concern that our employers have been expressing to us over the last few years. And that is, they have seen an increase in what they call renids. And that is, people who accept an offer, accept a proposal, and then go out and continue to date. And they, you know, they're engaged, they've accepted, but they date. And you know in the dating side that that's just not acceptable. That's a way to crash and burn. And so employers look at that renege on an acceptance in a very similar light. And we 
usually what happens is the employer calls the dean's office. And the dean's office calls the department and the department says, okay, is this egregious enough that it's an honor code violation? And if it is, you could be referred to the honor code office and potentially lose your degree. So don't do it. Just be wise. Pray before you accept, not after. Uh, and then, anyway, the rest of the analogy, we have a way. Don't want to spend a lot of time, but just be aware that this is a problem and it's one that you need to be concerned about. Let's talk about cover letters. Cover letters are interesting. <laughs> they introduce you to the employer or to the reader of the, of the resume. They are not required. And in fact, there are only a few organizations that, that want you to send a cover letter anymore. Very large organizations, large employers, uh, in, in some cases have, have just said, don't send, I, we don't need to read one more thing. Also, making if you don't have a cover letter, it makes your resume even more important. But behind the world of cover letters, they do some things. They dress up the resume, they put more information, and it is a place where you can provide data that isn't provided by the resume. Uh, they also introduce you to the reader, and the, a beautiful cover letter is one that says, Dear Bill Brady, I met you at the uh, campus career fair at BYU, and you suggested I send you my resume. There, you're no longer a cold call. You're a familiar person, and I'm always interested in finding some you know, having someone come back to me that I've already met. And so this is a way to introduce yourself. Uh, Dear Bill Brady, uh, John Doe of your company suggested that I send you my resume. John Doe, and, and I'm an employment manager, and I say, oh, definitely I want to take people who are referrals because they're, they're a higher value re candidate than is a cold call candidate. So that's, that's you use that introduction. You express your personal interests. What do you want to do? How, what are, what are, why are you writing to me about this job? And I find that it, it's a better way, because it's more narrative, than even an objective on your resume. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not a popular, or I'm not a, a fan of objective statements on resumes. Uh, and many of our companies have said, don't waste the time. Finally, what a, a, a cover letter will do is it will demonstrate your communication skills. And we do have a few employers who say, do write a cover letter. We don't mind if it's three pages long. Just And what they do is they read it. And they read it to find out how well you write and to find out how well you communicate because communication is very important to those organizations. And this is very true of consulting organizations. They want to know how well you communicate. Okay. I'm losing a battery here. Okay, what are the top five things? I'm just, just going to throw these up, let you take them from uh, the learning suite use, but readability uh, always includes something eye-catching, something that, that says to them, here's why you might be interested in me, uh, and then evidence that you know who I am. Here's a sample that I'll just give to you. And, and again, you don't have to copy this word for word. It's just an idea. So for the things that we need, we need to know who you are. We actually are very interested in you know, being able to get back to you. Now, before you give your address, and there will be a little caution slide later, if you're, if you're writing to a, a, a Craigslist Dropbox, and you don't know what this job is about, be cautious. Because one of the things that we found and that we've been cautioned in the National Association of Colleges is that's a way to rob identities. And so they've, they've created false jobs to just get all of the, the identity information. So if you don't know who the employer is or what the job is, you can just have an email that's only your employment email. And that's the only thing you need to put on there rather than an address. Uh, and again, just a caution about that. Anything that is posted on the bridge, our, our recruiting system, has already been screened. So you're safe to give those, those employment references uh, your, your contact information. 
So date it, by all means, that helps the recruiter know whether or not it's late or they're late. And address it to a person if it's at all possible. And, and when you do that, you're also going to address in the salutation now. If you don't know who it is, if it's just a Dropbox or it's just a send to opportunities app, sometimes it's best to do a little bit of a Google search or whatever mechanism you use to search and find out who are the leads for this organization and write to a person rather than just to a blank. Um, it's more meaningful and it's also easier for you to write. Next thing, we refer to the job. So introduce yourself and for most cases, if you can reference the job that you're writing about, it's helpful to the person who's going to read it. The next section of the letter is what are you offering them? Now I'm going to guess that in the job description that this relates to, they have something about teamwork. They have something about problem solving, and they had something about critical thinking as traits. So you're not repeating your resume, but you're taking pieces of, of experience that will refer back to your resume and saying, I have this. And so it's a nice way to build that what you're offering part of this thing. Finally, you're going to uh, say what happens next. And just a little hint, this is in here, and you'll see this second sentence. When I was a recruiter, I would call students and I'd say, I'd hear, you know, have a blank phone, a busy phone, or I'd get their message. And I would only call maybe three times maximum before I just gave up. I said, well, they're not calling me back. They obviously are not interested. But if it turns out that I was calling you every day at 11 o'clock and you were in class at 11 o'clock, by telling me when you're available, you help me to time my phone call a little better. The other thing that I want to recommend is be sure that the message that you have on your phone, on your voicemail, is very professional. I um, had a roommate who thought it was funny to put city dump on his phone. And a recruiter called, and guess what? They thought they had the city dump. And he didn't get any more calls. So. Just be wise. You're now adults. You're level. You're here to be professionals. So that's what you do. And then by all means, close it. All right? You can also write it in an email. And most of you will build your cover letters as emails. Same formality, same parts, same address things. The only thing that you have to watch out for is generally your email greeting will not have a phone number. And it's nice if you'll include a phone number in case they want to call. So, that, it's that simple. What, uh, what are cover letters about? Well, they're short, they include the position, they explain why you want the job, they clearly describe what you can contribute, they don't repeat your resume, you keep it very professional, and uh, you tell what's gonna happen next. By all means, this is just like your resume. You want it to be perfect. So watch the grammar, watch the spelling, watch the uh, typographical. This is going to be your dessert before dinner. This is the, a great hors d'oeuvre. So I want you to make it very tempting. I want you to make it so that it invites them to have the meal. One thing I'll caution you with is if you go to coverletters.com and send and adapt cover letter number 21, to many of our recruiters, and especially with the big firms, they're gonna say, oh, I've heard this before. That came from cover letter number 21. Uh, this person is not very original. This person is a copycat. And that doesn't bode well for you. So keep it personal. Keep it direct. Make it happen. And again, you may be writing to four of the big four accounting firms, and inevitably, every year I get a student who writes to KPMG, and someplace in the body of the letter, it says, I'm really looking forward to working with Deloitte. I promise you that letter gets thrown away. Pay attention, be careful. All right, let's talk about resumes. You'll probably get as many ways to write your resume as there are people to give you advice about resumes. Lots of times we have personal 
preferences. We come from different industries, and so we use those, those preferences and that experience to give advice. Sometimes it's not best to go to your mother or your father for advice if they aren't from the area that, that you're writing to. Um, and I'm going to put a little plug in for those who are counselors in the Career Center. Most of us have worked in the areas that uh, uh, we counsel in, and we at least know what is generally acceptable. So for supply chain, Eric is the man. So make it, you know, use that expertise. Um, again, it's, a, it's an art, not a science, and there are many ways to do it. Let's talk about some guidance. First guide is, I want you to provide me a wow factor. I want to see something that makes me look at this and say, wow, we've got to hire this person. This person should be in our organization. And so to build a wow factor, I'm going to focus on some things that are all results oriented. If, if you give me responsibilities, I was responsible for this, this, and this. I look at you and I say, you're just like everybody else who had that job, because that job had the same responsibilities. So how do I separate you from everyone else? So I don't want you to use responsibilities. I want you to show me what you did and focus on the results that happened because of how you executed those responsibilities. Always in the business world, we want to see some numbers, we want to see some comparisons, we want to you to provide me a context of what that, why I should value what you did. Now, as you do that, what it does is it <coughs> separates you from other candidates. So what I want to see you do is how, and, and we're going to use an example in a minute, but if you scooped ice cream, how did you scoop better than every other ice cream scooper in the job site. So, you know, help me to know how you were better, how you were different, what you did. Um, the other thing that I look for in a resume is evidence of passion. Why were you excited to be in this job? This is the proof that you loved the work. And you want to give me evidences and, and language that says, I got excited by this. This was something that was fun to do, and because I worked so hard, the result was better performance and better results. So show me that drive creativity. No responsibilities, okay? Here's the practice exercise. This was a statement on a resume. I scooped ice cream. If I'm gonna grade this resume, it gets a C, maybe even gets an E, because you use first person. You don't need to use first person in your resume. It's your resume, we assume. So the B version gives me a little more information. So served ice cream to 200 plus customers on the ship and suggested a method for reducing wait time by 50%. Ooh, you just planted a hook. I want to know how you do that. But it's still the B. So how do we get the A? Somebody, what's an A comment? Okay, served ice cream, what about sh increased revenue? Ooh, that's business speak. And how did you do that? By selling banana splits instead of ice cream cones, milkshakes. Then shifted the register positions and decreased customer wait time. <coughs> Interesting. You, you just planted another question for me. And then finally, gave me a comparison. I had a loyal group of customers who always appeared. Now, how do you get that information? Go to your employer. How did I do? What, they're, they're evaluating you all the time. They're doing performance reviews on you. What is it that I do? What is it that I do better? What is it that I can, and then you take that information and you use that information to promote you. Now, I want to talk about skills, and we, we said there are skills. The A version planted some skills for me as the reader. So if I increase ship revenue by upselling products, what is the skill that I'm demonstrating? Sales and revenue. I know, I understand 
the value of, of higher priced items. If I shifted the register, what does that demonstrate as a skill that you have? Critical thinking. I looked at a problem and thought through the actions and thought of another idea. And then finally, highest loyalty return rate. What are the skills involved in doing that? Customer relations. I was able to build a rapport with my customers to the point that they were repeats. And how did I know that? Well, I was standing here and I had five people waiting for me to serve them that I knew. And here was John who was my uh, uh, counterpart and nobody wanted to stay with John because they knew he was a slow scooper. So anyway, look at those kinds of things. Never, ever lie, all right? Never exaggerate. Give me clearly the truth. I want to know the truth, but I don't want you to be so humble that you forget to tell me what was good about you. So we'll talk more about that. DeFry University last year did a, a, an interesting study. They said, what are the most wanted skills from our employers? And uh, they did this in conjunction with the National Association of Colleges and Employers. Strong work base, ethical, dependable. Self-motivated, a very high degree of initiative from a college hire. Um, the ability to work well with others, teamwork and uh, good time management skills. That you knew how to, to bring work together and one that's sweet for our school is accountability. All right, just a quick quote. Many candidates already have these skills and they just need to bring them forward. This is uh, Microsoft's evangelist, so uh, corporate evangelist. Uh, present them, don't be afraid to give us those skills. All right. Provide evidence that you can do the work, show me those things, just be careful not to bloat the language. I want to be able to see it quickly, I want to be able to see it concisely. Okay. Rule number two, remember the reader. Uh, when I worked for the Bechtel organization, I had, we read, the office that I was over read 40,000 resumes a year. And I had eight recruiters, so they had 5,000 each to read. And this was in the days before we did a lot of, of uh, optical scanning on resumes. But the point was, they did a lot more than just read resumes. So if they spent a half an hour on every resume, they were overtime. So they basically, in 10 to 15 seconds, looked at the resume and said, this is good or this is bad. What I'm going to suggest for you, write your resume, put it together, and then I'd like you to try the friend test. Take it to a friend, maybe not your best friend because they know you too well, but a friend and say, read this for me, and you time it. And in 20 seconds, ask, take it away and ask them what they saw. And if they didn't see the things that you want that employer to see, then restructure and consider rewriting the resume in a way that the things that jump out in 10 seconds are the things that you want that employer to see. This is a, a, a test that was done a few years ago. Uh, it was an eye scan of, a, of, of recruiters when they were looking at a resume. So the bright uh, red and the, and the yellow are where their eyes spent more time. And it was interesting to just see the things that they were looking at. And, and uh, education being a huge one, even though this was an experienced candidate. So your education section is pretty valuable. And given that they're really hiring you for your education, <coughs> pay a lot of attention to what you put in that section of your resume. So what, it, what makes them want to read more? It's targeting. And it really is giving me skills, giving me words, giving me knowledge. <coughs> One of my suggestions to, to help the scanning process and to actually break the scan is that you always lead a section with what you see that they want. So you want to read it from the employer's perspective. You want to reflect the job posting and say, what is it that they're saying that they desire? And bullet number one is the, the thing they want most. So there's no rule that says what order bullets should go in. So make, make it bullet number one is what they want most. So always think from the target that you're aiming at. And, uh, and reflect there. You show your experience and the impact that benefits them. 
So you build it in a way that they're seeing all the time what, what's good. And then you help them understand that your brand is those things that, you, that they are seeing. I'm going to give you just a quick analogy. I, I, I'm a tie collector. And over the years, I found a tie that's kind of interesting because it works with a lot of different shirts. Your resume is like my tie. Your resume is fixed at any moment. And like my tie, you can't change that. But when you consider that the tie, when it's against a red shirt, the red jumps out. So the pieces of your resume that are red go with the red job. And that's how you build your resume in a way to reflect that target. Same thing, beige. Uh, this is kind of interesting. There's a little dot that's the same color as that uh, light green. So just an analogy, way to think about that process. I'm going to suggest that you build, to help you build your resume and also to help you prepare for interviewing, a, a matrix that looks like this. Over here are the, is the position that you held. Here are the job responsibilities. Here are the actions that you took to accomplish those responsibilities. Here are the results that happened from those actions. And then finally, say, what is it, what skills am I demonstrating when I do these things? Now, the beauty of this is, if, if what you, what the job is about is hiring and training a team, bullet number one under XYZ company is hire and train a team, bullet number one. And if they weren't worried about building a marketing plan, and that's not part of the responsibilities, you can actually leave that out because it's irrelevant in number one. So that way we build the process. We use this matrix to help you build the sentences that talk about the results that you, that you were able to obtain. The other beauty of this matrix is when you go to an interview, you're going to be asked a lot of behavioral-based questions. And the, for those of you who have taken MCOM, behavioral-based questions are answered with the PAR method. So what was the problem? OK, this is the problem. What were the actions that you took? There's the actions. And what were the results? And results, when you answer a behavioral question with what was the problem, what was the action, what were the results, that's a very satisfactory way to answer a uh, behavioral question, and you've already helped yourself be prepared for that process. So it's, it's a useful matrix. All right, let's go on. The appearance of your resume is important. A good resume has some white space, so it isn't a, it isn't a full page. It isn't like you know, a tale of two cities, first paragraph, 257 words in one sentence. And anyway, it's readable. I want, I'm going to suggest later that you should have a one-page resume as a college student. Um, I actually got to counsel some uh, Harvard MBA graduates once, and, and if they can write a one-page resume, I think you can too. But you don't do it by shrinking the font. So keep the font read readable. Uh, don't use un unusual fonts. This is, this is chiller. It you know, <laughs> drips blood. Um, and I had a student once use Chiller as, because he was writing to the Rocky Horror Picture Show Company. So I could understand that. But, but even they wrote back and said, would you send us your resume in a readable font? So you know, be professional. Just, you, if you're, what we do is we try to stand out by doing something exotic like that. And you stand out negatively. Don't do that to yourself. Again, target the reader. Communicate very clearly. Communicate concisely. Three things to remember, be consistent. Use the same abbreviations. Exercise restraint, multiple fonts, bright color, all of those things, you don't need that. Uh, and in most cases, limit the length. I'm gonna just show you a resume. So here's a resume, and here's the formatting consistencies, the style consistencies, abbreviation consistencies. The thing that I don't want you to do, again, is to use bright colored paper to try and convince me it stand out. It's negative. Um, the other thing that I don't want you to do is to mix fonts. You can use two, but three or four, I'm starting to think that you just are a cut and paster. So you know, don't do that. Also, I just moved the order of the mission experience from other into experience. As long as you don't say work experience, 
it may be something that's a legitimately an addition to your experience base. Again, I'm, we'll talk about missionary stuff again. We talked about the address concern, just be aware of that. Uh, I'll let you look at these on uh, Learning Suite. Objectives, I told you I'm not a big fan of objectives, and why? I think this is a bad objective. Because it doesn't tell me anything about it. It doesn't show me what you're about. Everybody wants this, right? So I go back to a quote from one of my, my recruiters, um, Dan Black, who was the uh, head of recruiting for all of, of EY. He said, what I want to see is a fast match to my job, not a jack of all trades. So objectives that are trying to be a jack of all trades, resumes that are trying to be a, a jack of all trades, are not very successful. Because you look, you look lukewarm to everything and not hot to anything. OK, use an objective, make it specific. I'll let you read this again from the Learning Suite. Summaries are very popular in resumes right now. And they're useful, but be careful, especially where you don't have a lot of work experience. That summary better sizzle, because it said, I, if I read a summary and I don't see what I want, I don't have to read the rest. It's a summary. So be cautious about using summaries. Uh, you know, make them specific. Uh, it, it, I would rather see you put the detail or the, the reference right inside the body of the cover of the uh, resume. And then finally, keep it short. Uh, the one thing that I do see summaries of are computer skills. So you may have a skills section that talks about that. Okay, let's talk about your education section. Normally your highest degree is first. It is a Bachelor of Science from the Marriott School, not a bachelor's unless you've got two. It's a bachelor's degree, but it has to have an apostrophe. So just remember that when you write it, let's write it right. When you show your graduation date, don't put in front of it anticipated, projected, planned, hoped for. You know, the idea is don't put any doubt at all in the recruiter's mind. If they can't figure out that April 2015 is projected, don't work for that employer. They're not smart enough for you, so you know, just consider that. So here's a quick write-up and, and, and just, again, an example. Uh, one of the things that I would suggest is we love the Marriott family for giving us their name. This is a place where you can put a scan interrupter. By using the word Marriott, there are enough people who have stayed in Marriott's, who think about the Marriott, and it, it's a big name interrupter. And they hit that, and they, they don't consciously do it. <laughs> That's why I stayed there once. I had a great experience. No. But it slowed them down. It slowed the scan. And so I like the idea of using that. Another point to uh, make is that we are the school of management, not business. Be correct, because there are some people who graduated from the School of Management who know that, and they read your resume, and you just made an error. Uh, do put your grade point in. That's a great grade point. But they hire people all the way from 2.5 to 4.0. So help the, the recruiter know that. If they're going to screen on grades, you're giving them a, a chance before they have to ask you for a transfer. All right, let's talk about your experience. Experience is who you work for, what you learn, and what you accomplish. And one of the things that I would suggest is if you've got some big brand name experience, lead with that experience. And use it to introduce you, because the brand, as a leader, says a lot to them. Um, you know, I may have been a janitor at the Walt Disney Company of, of Disney World, or uh, you know, I served food. But the fact that you work for the happiest place on earth says something about your character and what they did to screen you. So let that brand speak for you. Next is, uh, what did you do? What were you? Give me that title of that position. Um, here's, again, a write up, just an example. Don't copy it word for word. So what have I got? I've got the super employer. I've got the position. I've got the years that I worked there. Maybe a little description if super employer isn't really well known. And then come my accomplishments and my resilience. These are the things that sell you to them. That's most of the other is just explanation. 
okay? Going to encourage you to do a, an internship. A lot of our hires today are coming from internships. Um, let's talk briefly about missions and then we're almost done. We use or have suggested that we use volunteer representative and this was a request actually from the church because they don't want you to appear as an employee of uh, the church, you were not. However, if you know that the, the area or the, the people who are reading it understand missions, go ahead and use missionary and uh, you know, again, it's your choice, the decision. By all means, spell the name of the church correctly. It is a lowercase d and a high d. Um, the other thing that I don't want you to do is to ever exaggerate. I told you don't lie. This happened on one of our resumes, and, and I promise you, the finance clerk of the mission is not the CEO. So, I'll give you this, and, and again, let you go to Learning Suite to see the detail, but these are activities that you did and these are business terms that describe those activities. So it's just something for you to see. Last rule, focus on accomplishments. I want you to look at everything that's on your resume and ask this question. Does it support my candidacy or does it take away? And if it does not, take it out. It shouldn't be there. Um, don't, you know, make them say how, not so well. Finally, use action verbs. There are lists of action verbs online. Again, we talked about responsible for, we talked about the first person formatting, keep it clear, keep it concise, okay to have a line along and keep the left hand aligned, ragged edges are okay, likewise you can do it that way. Um, one point, just last point to make here, we found in a study that we, we went to recruiters and we asked them, to, we gave them the same resume formatted three different ways. And when we asked them which one they liked, when the weight of the resume was in the upper left-hand corner versus the middle or the lower right-hand corner, they liked this resume every time. So if you can weight it that way, do it. It's because you know, we read from top to bottom, left to right, and our eyes are tired when we get down here, and we need white space to rest our eyes. So that's, and if, if you can't do it, don't worry about it, it's okay. Again, reverse chronological order, that'll explain it. You can get that from Learning Suite. Talk about bullets. I had a finance student who once put all dollar signs for his bullets. Uh, the recruiter said, we like this person, great candidate, but we're afraid he wants too much money. So watch out for the <laughs> graphics, be careful about that. You can mix tenses in a resume, very definitely do that. Again, we talk about typos. We talk about graphics. What else do we need to talk about? One page, make it good. Oh, no taglines. You do not need to waste a line on your resume with this statement. Of course, if they want res references, you'll give it to them. It's fine. All right, that should go out. I'm going to give you these from the learning suite. Thank you very much.